Have you ever been in a place in your life where you didn't want anything to change? Like life just seemed perfect and you thought, if everything could just stay exactly as it is now. I think about when my kids were growing up and how I, I always felt like I wanted time to move slower. I wanted to enjoy it more. But as much as I miss them being small and cute, each stage moves us to deeper stages of love and enjoyment and even challenges. Each stage has its own high points and its own heartaches. Today, we're gonna look at what it's like to move on and to say goodbye. George Washington is the first president of the United States and he is unanimously the best and most qualified person for the job. All the colonists have ever known was the English monarchy back over there. Actually, I think it's over there going, that's west, east, yeah, yeah, that way, definitely. All they've known is the English monarchy, but they have established this new democratic republic. And while today we follow a two consecutive term limit, uh, there were no term limits set at the beginning and people kind of just assumed as long as we keep voting for George Washington, he'll just continue to be president. Well, today we're taking a look at the song One Last Time and it is George Washington's goodbye song. I will include a link in the description below. If you'll click on that link, you can listen to the song, follow along with the lyrics. I'd love to hear your comments down below on anything that stood out to you, things that maybe you found interesting or maybe things that you learned for the very first time. Oh man, that song is a showstopper. Chris Jackson absolutely belted out. It just is so great. I love that song. Originally, it wasn't One Last Time, it was One Last Ride. And it had Washington asking Hamilton to write him a speech, and then the two of them marching off to fight in the Whiskey Rebellion. And, and it was okay, and it did well, but it wasn't exactly what they wanted. It wasn't the showstopper that they, that they wanted it to be. It wasn't this great climax that they thought that George Washington should have on his way out. So they decided to work on it a little bit. Now, this was a difficult task for Lin-Manuel Miranda. He wanted to keep certain things about the song that he loved, but also at the same time, writing this brand new song and trying to integrate these new ideas, he compared it to merging a vanishing soap bar with a brand new bar of soap and trying to get them to meld together to become one bar of soap. And the line, everyone sit under their own vine and fig tree and no one shall make them afraid is from one of Washington's favorite Bible verses, Micah 4.4. It expressed his desire to return home to Mount Vernon, to depart from, as he called it, the great theater of action. During the rewrite, Thomas Kale, who was the play's director, mentioned to Lynn manuel Miranda the whole vine and fig stuff, but Lynn was like, what are you talking about? And he's like, yeah, you know, the, the vine and fig, you know, the Bible verse. Wait, I don't know what you're talking about. It's his favorite Bible verse. Wait, what? So they look up the Bible verse and then he's like getting all these ideas. He's like, I know what we're gonna do. I know what we're gonna do. And he changes the song and rewrites it. And the cool part is because they'd already been performing, Lynn is familiar with Chris Jackson and with his voice. And he's like, now I'm gonna write this song at the points that work best for Chris Jackson on the intervals in which he sings the best. It's pretty much what Hamilton did for Washington. Hamilton Hamilton wrote this speech for Washington and he knew Washington and he knew where Washington would hit it out of the park. And Lynn, who plays Hamilton, is writing this song for Chris Jackson, who plays Washington, and he knows exactly how he's gonna sing it and where he's gonna do his best. The line in the speech that says, the hope that my country will view them, and he starts talking about his, his mistakes. And this section of the speech, Washington seeks to do exactly what the musical is trying to do. Paint these great leaders as human, capable of mistakes and error, but also capable of greatness. We are a mixture of our greatest successes and also our greatest failures. It is all of those things together that make us who we are. And our story is really incomplete when we only focus on one side or the other. We are not defined simply by our greatest successes and we are not defined simply by our worst mistakes. And I think this is so important that we understand that our, our heroes, whether it's from history or sports or music or whatever, they're humans. 
They're not superhumans. It is a very dangerous and unhealthy thing when we see anything that is not God as infallible, unable to make mistakes. Let's move on to song meaning and we'll explore this idea a little bit more. What do we learn about our characters from this song? Washington wants to step down so the country continues to grow and mature without him. Washington wants to ensure the long-term health of the United States of America. This peaceful transfer of power is truly a unique endeavor and it happens every four to eight years. We pass power on peacefully. We're not taken over by other leaders. There's no usurping the presidency. Chris Jackson wrestled with the fact that Washington, while he was this great man and perhaps our greatest president, he was also a, a slave owner. So he has this really great side to him, but then there's this really negative side. And he thought, how do I deal with this? How do I reconcile this? How do I, do I, do I need to justify it? Do I need to find a way to make it right in my mind to play this great man? Is he a great man or do we just cancel out all that he's done and say, no, he had slaves, so uh, he's no longer a great man. In the end, he decided he would leave it unreconciled. You guys, that is something that we don't do very often today. We don't leave things in the middle. We don't leave things unsettled. And it's okay to be able to do that. We don't have to justify someone's wrongdoings just because we like them. And at the same time, we don't have to cancel out every good thing they've done because they did something wrong. We are a mix of both of these worlds, good and evil. Chris decided he would portray the great side of Washington, but not gloss over this sinful side. He decided to make a subtle contribution in the final song when Eliza sings that Alexander would have done more to fight slavery if he only had more time. Chris Jackson is just over her shoulder and when she says that you see him put his head down in shame as kind of a way of Chris Jackson the actor accepting some responsibility for the things that Washington didn't make better. This is an important lesson for us today, even within our country, to recognize the greatness alongside our capacity to commit atrocity. If we can't recognize those negative things that we've done, we won't be able to fix them in the future. So let's take a look at what scripture has to say about letting go. As we mentioned last time, David's family was embroiled in conflict the rest of his life. Because of his sin with Bathsheba, he essentially cursed his family. One of his sons, Amnon, rapes his stepsister, Tamar. Tamar's brother, Absalom, then kills Amnon. Well, of course, Absalom has to flee the country because he killed his own brother. He eventually builds up an army and decides, you know what, I'm actually gonna be the next one in line, so if I get rid of my dad, then I'll be king. And so eventually David himself, the king, has to flee for his life. His son comes in with an army. He assumes the throne and it says the people of the country love him. They called him a man of the people. And the Bible says that he had long hair, not like mine. There was no man better looking than he was. Ladies. David is on the run and at one point Absalom is chasing his dad through the forest trying to chase him down. And the Bible says that Absalom gets his hair caught in a branch and he's stuck, hanging from the branch by his hair. And David's general, Joab, finds him and thrusts three spears into his chest, killing him. It's just nonstop tragedy in David's house. David tells God that he wants to build a temple for him, but God tells him because he has so much blood on his hands, because he's been involved in so much war and bloodshed, he says that task will be saved for the next king. And as we mentioned last time, David, of course, does have another son. He names him Solomon. Solomon becomes king. Solomon becomes the wisest wealthiest king ever, and he builds the temple. In 2 Samuel 23, verses 1 through 7, David shares his last words, and they're a poem, they're a song. And I thought it was appropriate, given that we're studying a musical, and that David's final contribution is essentially the words to a song. These are the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, speaks. David, the man who was raised up so high. David, the man appointed by God of Jacob. David, the sweet psalmist of Israel. The Spirit of the Lord speaks through me. 
His words are upon my tongue. The God of Israel spoke. The rock of Israel said to me, the one who rules righteously, who rules in the fear of God, is like the light of morning at sunrise, like a morning without clouds, like the gleaming of the sun on new grass after rain. Is it not my family God has chosen? Yes, he has made an everlasting covenant with me. His agreement is arranged and guaranteed in every detail. He will ensure my safety and success. But the godless are like thorns to be thrown away, for they tear the hand that touches them. One must use iron tools to chop them down. They will be totally consumed by fire. David had major faults, and he paid greatly for his sin. But his heart was for God. And God honored that and blessed him and his descendants for many generations. Which is an interesting point because I just said that David essentially cursed himself because of his sin with Bathsheba. How can God curse you and bless you at the same time? Well, we see it here. Remember, God is holy. God is just. He does punish us for our sin. And David paid the price and his family paid the price for his sin. But for generations after that, God honored David's love for him, and he blessed his descendants after that. We can be the recipients of both blessings and curses from God. So David passes away, and Israel loses its first truly great king. But they had to learn to move on. But then again, they'd already done this before. If we back way up into Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 34, Moses has led the people out of slavery in Egypt. He used the 10 plagues. He crossed the Red Sea. They wandered through the desert for 40 years. God used Moses to bring water out of a rock and to provide manna and quail every day. He received the 10 commandments from God and spoke nearly face to face with him. Moses was able to heal people from poisonous snake bites and he did many other miraculous things through the power of God. But because of his own disobedience, he would not be allowed to lead the people into the promised land. That would go to the next leader. Then Moses climbed Mount Nebo across from Jericho. There the Lord showed him the whole land from Gilead to Dan, all the land of Judah as far as the Mediterranean Sea. Then the Lord said to him, This is the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When I said, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you will not cross over into it. And Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in Moab. As the Lord had said, he was buried in Moab. Moses was 120 years old when he died. Yet his eyes were not weak, nor his strength gone. The Israelites grieved for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days until the time of weeping and mourning was over. Now Joshua, son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him. So the Israelites listened to him and did what the Lord had commanded Moses. Since then, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face who did all those signs and wonders the Lord sent him to do in Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all of his officials and to his whole land. For no one has shown the mighty power or performed the awesome deeds that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. Moses does amazing things. God uses him in incredible, amazing ways. But because of his sin, because of some, some, because of some really dumb, selfish things he did, he also faced punishment. And God said, you don't get to take them into the promised land. I'm gonna leave that for the next leader. Our leaders, our heroes, they're human, just like you, just like me. They're fallible, they make mistakes, and we should remember their great deeds, but also recognize and learn from their mistakes. Next week, oh, this is a big one. It's Quiet Uptown. That one always makes me cry. We're gonna talk about living with loss and finding forgiveness. We'll see you next week.